Hi, everybody. This is Slava Kuriliak. I am super excited to kick off the stream featuring Samir at Sun Culture. This live stream is meant to educate, inspire, and share best practices for how companies can use modern technologies to scale their business. I'm very excited to speak with Samir. He is somebody who I have been able, uh, been finally able to reach. He is a very busy man. He has a lot of things going on. His team and his company has recently raised capital for Sun Culture, and I'm excited to bring him on the show to chat about how companies can use modern technologies to help farmers. Right, the agriculture, the agri business, farming industry needs help. They need modern solutions to solve modern problems and this discussion is aimed to help individuals companies and farmers to make sense of the technologies available and to consider what are all the options that are possible in today's world so i'm super excited to bring on samir i want to welcome samir he will quickly come on at right about now and uh hi samir pleasure to have you hey man how are you I'm doing great. I'm so glad to finally speak with you. It's uh, it's a great so pleasure happy as well. Thank you so much for reaching out and for having me on and for being patient with the uh, recent travel schedules that I had. But I'm I'm super excited to be here. Absolutely, yeah. We definitely <clears throat> would would love to start our discussion with COVID. Right, COVID is on everyone's minds. You know, it's affecting everything we do, from <clears throat> like you mentioned, travel to even the way we think about uh, normal day-to-day -day life. So I want to start, Samir, with the foundation, right? 2020 was the year of the Black Swan. It was something that nobody could see coming. It was an event that really caught a lot of people by surprise. Agriculture is one of the industries that got affected. Farming definitely got affected. So I want to start our discussion, figuring out what are some of the things that we noticed for how the industry was affected by by COVID-19. So I'm curious, so Sarah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I'll speak specifically from the Sub-Saharan Africa perspective. Um, and I'll give some anecdotes from Kenya because that's where I was stuck. So I was actually closest to the, um, the beginning days of COVID in Kenya. Um, what's interesting about the way COVID has affected rural off-grid small farmers is that these are folks that are outside of normal support structures. These are folks that don't have social safety nets. These are folks that already lack access to a lot of the basic infrastructure that you and I have. So when you have a global pandemic, which is scary, it shuts down agriculture value chains because there's lockdowns. You have uncertainty around movement and selling your goods. Plus, in East Africa, we had locusts, we have floods, droughts that have been caused by climate change. So smallholder farmers were completely crushed. And there was a lot of data that was done in the beginning months of COVID last year, sort of June, July, August, September, sort of at the height of the uncertainty. And if you look at all of the farmers in Kenya that were surveyed, they had nine out of 10 farmers reported losing income during COVID times. You have less than 40% of farmers feeling confident about their next growing season. And that's in the rural areas. And when you when you look at in urban areas, there's some really sad anecdotes. I'll share one with you. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of folks had to skip meals. So there was a lot of stories of people saying that they're skipping meals or they have skipped meals because they don't have enough money. And you I heard a story of a woman who didn't have enough money to pay for sort of extra meals for her kids that day. So what she did is she took some rocks and she put rocks into a pot and she cooked those rocks. So it sounded like she was cooking food. So her kids thought that she was making food and she kind of pushed them through lunch that way. So just, it's really sad, really sad. Yeah, it's, in, it's incredible time. Absolutely. And at the same time, I also want to remind everyone here who is listening, our future listeners, uh, for those who are watching this uh, live video in the future, that COVID-19, while it was something that um, often was considered to, be, to have a negative impact on the way that we operate, especially for 
or what we took for granted, it also presents an opportunity. And, and not a lot of people focus on this, but I think it's important to understand, yes, um, it is something that happened and it's something that we could not foresee, but at the same time, we can learn and we can move forward better so that by the next coronavirus, we we're more prepared, we're able to better adjust to uh, in other circumstances. You know, some of you have mentioned some of the natural disasters are actually a great uh, sort of worst case scenario to consider, because if you're mentally prepared for that scenario now, uh, even coronavirus, then you're able to um, sort of be in a position where you're less affected. So let's chat about what has people learned um, to do better, right? What were the positives as a result of COVID-19? So, I mean, we can have a whole conversation around how some of the work that we're doing is foundations for decentralization and creating sovereignty for communities. Um, I'll talk specifically from the sun culture perspective, and then we can we can go broader if you want. But our our solution enabled. We actually surveyed farmers at the same period of the of the survey that I mentioned just previously, and when nine out of ten farmers in Kenya were losing money about 90% of sun culture farmers were making money. And we had 95% of our customers reported improving their quality of life during coronavirus. And for us, that's what wakes us up in the morning. And one of the positives that came out of that was that we fast-tracked our engagement with the government in West Africa and um, are rolling out Africa's first commercial scale solar irrigation subsidy program. So governments started seeing solutions that were working on the ground and started scaling them up at a national level. So I think this gave people an opportunity to look at really acutely and have to make really fast decisions of what's working, what's not working, and let's put our let's put our money towards what's working and helping it scale. So I think it, it focused people in some way. You know, as human beings, we're not always we're not built to take in all of the information that we're given. And when we talk about some of the crises around climate change, agriculture, food systems, these are massive systemic problems that span centuries and that have a lot of little inputs that go into them and they're big. And sometimes, I mean, often as human beings, we're not, we're not developed to process all of that. So sometimes we have too many choices and we don't know what solutions to choose in order to move forward. And, we kind of get stuck in this in this process of trying to figure out what the best solution for it is and we don't make decisions. I think COVID forced people to make decisions and I think COVID forced people to pick solutions and across different sectors to say, okay, what's the best health mechanism right now? What are the best support mechanisms for, for social safety nets? You know, maybe it's direct cash transfers or what types of technologies can support rural offered farmers? Whatever the problem, whatever the question was, it forced people to make decisions quickly. And I think that that muscle was an important one to be able to flex. Because we have a lot more challenges ahead of us. And I think COVID really got people into the habit of starting to make decisions more quickly. I really appreciate you sharing your insights, Samir, about the negatives and the positives of COVID-19. Let's chat a little bit more about sun culture. You, as a team, have recently raised capital. Congratulations. What are your you. uh, sort of current, um, what is the current standpoint? M meaning like, where are you at today? And where do you want to get to next? So where we're at today as a company, we're at about 300 people, or a little over 300 people. We operate in Kenya. We distribute in Uganda, in Ethiopia, in Togo. Uh, we're running pilots in other markets right now. And we're in the phase of just pure growth, pure scaling. Our technology works, our business model works, our financing platform works, um, our customers are happy. Um, we have a good reputation in Kenya and outside of Kenya. We have a fantastic team. And now it's about how do we take our solution and help more farmers get access to this? And it's it's an interesting time for us. I'm just going to put on a sweater right now. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting time for us because we're, you know, when we started the business, it it we, you know, when you when you start a business, you have unlimited options of what you do, but you have to choose one. No resources. 
no experience, no team. You kind of have to choose one and go forward. Right now, we have capital, we have a team, we have experience, we're in new markets, and we almost have to figure out now, out of all of the options that we have, what do we choose? What products and services do we layer on top of our platform in order to help maximize value for our customers? And this is the first time that we've had so much choice. So it's almost a different set of decisions that we have to make, but in a similar style of starting a business again, it's what's next and what do we layer on to create shareholder value and create customer value. So it's a very unique, unique point in time for us right now. I really appreciate you sharing your, your current standpoint. It's very important to, to also lay the foundation for impact, right? All companies are um, behind the scenes aiming to generate revenue, uh, cut costs, save time. But when, when we look at the, um, the reasons why they do what they do, it's often based on the impact they want to make on the world. So let's talk about sort of what is your vision for how you and your team can impact the world, right? I see you're starting <clears throat> with a very technology-oriented focus. You're, you're providing practical tools to farmers, and that's an amazing uh, starting point. But where do you see the, the, the impact grow, like maybe one year, two years, five years from now? You know, it's, it's um, the more we do this work, the more we see the trickle down effects or triple up effects of the work that we're doing. You know, we, we sit in the middle of a lot of different really big challenges. So on one hand, you have rural poverty. Most of the people making up the world's poorest are small farmers who live off grid and in rural areas who with access to the right technology and services and financing can prosper. So in one sense, we're helping a group of people lift themselves out of poverty. In a sort of intersecting circle of the Venn diagram, these are folks that are growing the food that we all need in order to survive. You know, the World Food Program says that by 2050, we have to double the amount of food that we grow. It just so happens that one of the most one of the easiest and most sort of efficient and proven ways to do this is to utilize the smallholder farmers that we have in emerging markets, specifically sub-Saharan Africa. Lots of farmers, lots of untapped resources, lots of unused farmable land. You combine those and we can actually create a food basket for, for the world in Africa. So by empowering smallholder farmers to improve and protect their productivity, we're also safeguarding our own food, food supply for the future. And then there's a sort of a third intersecting circle and that's climate change. You know, smallholder farmers produce very little CO2 emissions. Bill Gates just did a nice little piece on this. And he said that small farmers, for example, in Kenya, emit 55 times less carbon than the average American. Yet these are the folks that are most affected by climate change because remember as farmers, they need water in order to grow crops or water animals. And that's how they make money. And with the rains being more inconsistent and more unreliable, they're, like I said, crushed by climate change. So their options are either buying a really dirty, polluting diesel or petrol pump or using a clean technology like solar. So we're also looking at how do we, one, mitigate climate change, uh, more climate change um, by helping people adopt clean technologies, but also how do we help these communities adapt to what climate change throws at them to create resiliency and sovereignty to help them support the communities, grow the food we need and sort of start that circle again. So sort of if you take rural poverty, food security and climate change and in the middle are actually smallholder farmers. And these are some of the most forgotten people in the world. So we're trying to give them a voice and we're trying to also make them bankable. We're trying to show people that Investing in small farmers is profitable for you. It's profitable for them. It's profitable for the, for the world. I don't believe in silver bullets, but solar irrigation for small farmers is really close. It just solves a lot of problems right now. It's not the only thing that solves problems, but it's a solution that works and a solution that's scalable. And it's something that I think can help move the world in the right direction. Absolutely, Samir. <clears throat> I also want to remind our listeners that this is a live stream so if you have any questions for samir while we are chatting with him feel free to leave them 
in the chat section below or on your right, depends where you're joining from. And then beyond that, I will also post a link for anyone who is watching this. If you have a question for Samir or would like to uh, come on stage and actually ask him the question directly, I encourage you to actually go and click on um, the link. The link is go.produve.com slash live. And this will allow you to come on stage and actually speak to Samir or myself one-on-one uh, -on -one. so this is a great way for you to engage in case you're interested if not that's okay too you know don't feel um, like pressured to do so this is just something we're trying because we want to see how well it performs beyond that I'm, cool. <laughs> thanks Samir I uh, would like to also talk to you about a very high level uh, topic which is you know humanity was very uh, keen to solve a very specific problem especially in 20 20. That problem was COVID-19. We, we've sort of rallied troops. Everyone got on board. Everyone was thinking, you know, how do we slow the spread? How do we uh, flatten the curve to make sure that people are less affected by COVID-19, right? Today, we see so many problems in the world that require a similar mindset. How can we gather uh, resources around the world and solve big problems? Now, one of these problems that I see that is uh, clear and that's been around for a long time <clears throat> is climate change, right? Climate change, if we're able to address climate change uh, holistically as nations, yeah, as individuals, business owners, government, etc., then we're able to at least address some of the issues that we see in farming, right? So the better we're able to, for example, make predictions of the weather, the better we're able to control parts of the weather, the better we can actually have a, a farm uh, operate more efficiently. So my question to you is, what are your thoughts on, you know, collectively coming together uh, from different nations, pulling resources and doing our best to solve for climate change so that we eventually affect and positively uh, impact places like farmers. You know, climate change, climate change isn't the, isn't the only foundational problem, but it is a foundational problem. From climate change spurs inequality, so well, I was just explaining how small farmers are getting completely wrecked by climate change. Um, you look at gender inequality. So this often affects the women of the households more. Um, you know, up in northern Kenya, for example, there's a lot of um, women, girls who are sort of sold into child marriage because their family needs more money because of the effects of climate change. So it affects women extremely horribly. Um, Climate change causes wars. You have a lot of climate refugees who end up leaving their areas because they can't farm, going into major cities. Major cities become too populated um, and wars start. Um, so climate change is, is, is a foundation to so many global problems. Like I said before, I think that it's so big and so complicated and it, 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 it pulls in so many different parts of the earth, right? You're talking about the ocean. You're talking about um, Arctic ice melting, you're talking about CO2 emissions, you're talking about farming soy, you're talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of practices and pieces that come together to create this massive problem. And it's complicated and it's scientific and not everyone can understand it. And what in the age of TikTok and Instagram and unlimited access to data, we just have so much information coming at us. We're not, we're not built to process everything that we're receiving. So what I think is really interesting is how do you take big problems like climate change? How do you get the smartest people in the world together? And how do you source ideas and select five ideas and say collectively, globally for the next five years, we're gonna be taking these five solutions that are proven that work, and we're gonna funnel most money into that. You see, funding is what's needed to scale solutions. You need incentives, you need money, you need government policy, and you need funding. So even with government fund policy, if you have funding spread out across you know, hundreds of solutions, you won't necessarily see the needle move. So I, I think we need to move away from small, you know, $1 million, $2 million, $10 million grants or investments. We need hundreds of millions of dollars coming together and saying, we're going to take these five solutions. And for the next five years, we're going to concentrate most of our funding into that and scale that and then reevaluate after the five years. So I think it's 
how do you simplify the pool of choices in order to allocate funding more effectively in order to see change? And that's a hard process because you have to think about who's on the judging panel, how do you source, et cetera. But I think that if we can, I call it a sort of a five for five campaign. How do you, how do you take five ideas, commit to it for five years in order to pool capital in order to see real results? And I think that that simplified mechanism will help us actually see the change that we're looking for. I love this analogy, five for five. I, I think it's a very <clears throat> simple um, sort of mechanism to latch onto when you're trying to explain complex projects like research projects or people who are trying to understand um, how research works. I'll share with you, Samir, a strategy that my team and I have used when we think about technology in general. And it, it's very similar to what you described. When we in, envision the future, right? When, for example, when clients come to us and they ask us, can you help us to develop a specific technology for the future? We often play the what we call the Wayne Gretzky game. And uh, for those who are not familiar, Wayne Gretzky was one of the best hockey players of all time. Um, and he is so good at, at what he does, or rather was good, that he was able to, in a way, predict where the, the puck was going to be. Right. And so uh, one of the things that he said was, you know, if you want to if you want to be a great hockey player, you need to be uh, where the, the puck will be as opposed to where it is right now. So this is a problem that we see with a lot of companies, a lot of research, even research uh, has these limitations that they often focus on the present. Right. So they take an, a present problem and they try to solve it. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that because the present is very sort of shiny. It's very glittery. You know, things pop up. They seem urgent in the moment. And uh, we often forget that if we really want to see change, if we really want to see um, a ground, groundbreaking of sort of changes as well as innovation, we really need to look at the future, right? We need to start with the future in mind and then we need to work backwards. So the Wayne Gretzky game is a, a very simple game that allows um, anyone to project into the future first. And let's say, let's say the future is, Samir, that you know, there are... Um, you have farmers who are um, operating farms fully autonomously, right? You have a fully autonomous farm that uses drones, that uses robots, that has you know um, different cameras that are placed within the farm and everything is fully automated. So let's say this is one possible future, right? This is sort of step one. Then you, we come back, but instead of coming back to the present, we come back into, let's say, uh, five years, 10 years from now. Right. And then we ask, OK, so, yeah, the future is fully autonomous operation. That's amazing. And then, you know, what does five years from now look like? Right. So perhaps we first envision 50 years from now and then we sort of come back and say, OK, what is the next 10 years going to look like? So perhaps we just need to have systems that are able to communicate and learn from data more efficiently. And the Wayne Gretzky game encourages anyone to project into the future first and then bring that reality back, but not to the present, slightly, slightly ahead. And the advantage of doing this is that we're able to immediately see the obstacles that stand in our way. You know, we know the future is a certain um, perspective. We know that the present uh, has lots of limitations. So we're the roadblocks that, that lead to that future state. And we're also able to build technologies better, right? Because if we're building, for example, for the next 50 years, you know, we think on a different level. We are thinking long term. We're thinking, you know, uh, fundamental concepts as opposed to solving the problems in, in uh, sort of the day to day life. So I love this game and I, I wanted to share it with you because I think it's it's Thank amazing uh, to consider. So I, I love that you're thinking yeah. long term. Right. So anytime you're con con considering solving problems <clears throat> for, you know, five, 10 years for the future, it's a great way to go. And, and now sort of Thank I want to start shifting to. Um, the, the concept of using, um, using data to, to, prog to pro progress from where you are today. So mm -hmm. you guys have lots of clients, you have um, lots of technologies already in place. You know, solar technology is the sort of the, the fundamental tech that you're relying on. And I want to start to ask you questions about data. How do you see your brand leverage data and, and how can data be a competitive advantage for you? So I, I'll ask that question just on the point of the Wayne Gretzky model. Yes. Um, one, of the other, one of the other skill sets that I think is really important to pair that with is the sort of super adaptability, right? We're moving from a, a complicated world into now a complex world. And the difference is a complicated world is predictable 
and a complex world is unpredictable. And being able to be super adaptable as you're backcasting, right? Setting your sights in the future and backcasting, I think pairing those two together can make super, super, superhero companies. Oh, um, I love it. So yeah. data is data is really interesting for us because you know we lend to our customers, right? So mm -hmm. um, affordability is the number one hindrance in scaling these types of technologies in emerging markets because of the high cost. So what we do is our farmers pay us in monthly installments of up to 30 months. And that allows them to make money using our system and pay us from the increase in revenue they make. So we're not really disrupting their disposable income. And that's allowed us to scale in the way that we have. Um, one of the interesting things about credit is that oftentimes people give credit by pattern matching. So I've lent to someone that looks like you, so I can lend to you, you know? You have either the same social profile or in our case, the same kind of house, the same kind of phone history, et cetera, et cetera. What gets really interesting for us is that we're not always lending based off of a human being. We're also lending based off of the asset that's creating value, which is the irrigation system and the farm. But there's really no way for us to pattern match because we can't, everything looks the same from the beginning. But what if there's a way for us to figure out if someone is using our system correctly mid-season, or if they're using a system in a way that could be optimized and then providing them support so they become better payers and we can offer them better credit. So our, our system receives a lot of data, usage data, pump usage data, solar data, water data, and we're able to now start to create usage patterns around how do we match certain pairs to certain usage patterns? And when people fall out of sync, we can actually provide them service mid-season to make them better pairs. Now, what that does for us is that creates a higher repayment for us, which means that our cost of capital goes down, which means our price goes down, which means we can reach more customers. So that's one simple way in using data just to figure out how do we create better credit scores mid-season and figure out different payment profiles so we can provide different services towards them. This is a great use case of um, optimizing what you have. So, you know, you, you recognize that things are already working. Perhaps you're able to catch when things are not working and then you're able to optimize for those scenarios. Samir, I also want to chat with you about um, some of the, the latest trends you've seen in solar, right? Solar technology is blowing up right now. And we know that because the battery technologies are, are incredibly, um, um, sort of changing and those changes are coming in from multiple sources, right? One is from the solar technology itself. The others are coming in from um, cars that are now being sort of electrified and electrification is driving a lot of this innovation. So I wanna to talk to you about trends, especially in battery and solar technology. So, I mean, the, the easiest one to see that most people listening I may have heard of is this, the, the cost curves are going down so fast. You know, when we started the business, we were selling the most affordable solar irrigation systems in Africa at $5,000. Now, remember, we're working with customers Whoa. that don't make so much money. So that was very challenging. <laughs> uh, we ended up reducing the price of that system by 90%. So we have a $500 entry point in product. So that's, first and foremost, I don't think people realize how fast the cost curves are declining. Um, and that's just amazing. And that's not even just across solar and batteries you're talking about i'm talking about um edge computing i'm talking about the ability to share information across different networks i mean it's it's connectivity costs are going down massively um so just the the ability to make technology the ability to capture data the ability to analyze data all of that is going down massively um for example we we um we have created a weather model that has probably the best weather forecast in Kenya. And we SMS our customers what the weather is gonna be so they can figure out how to irrigate um, that day. Um, we were only able to do that because of the cost for essentially running a cloud-based supercomputer. You know, a few years ago, we would have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe millions of dollars to run these computations. Whereas now, we can kind of use the cloud-based supercomputer at a much more affordable rate, allowing us to process data much faster, much cheaper, 
and allows us to give those services to our customers. So I think that that's just across the board, not even just solar prices for things are going down. Um, across solar and batteries, you see some really interesting um, material science happening out of a few different countries, both the US and China. Um, I think from our context in emerging markets, it's not as applicable. You know, it's really funny because when you look at some of the, the technology trends in let's say the US where it, go, where it comes from, um, but battery solars, whether it's battery management systems or, or material science around solar, um, those, those trends don't necessarily affect the work that we do because the, the name of the game for us is oper, oper, operational execution. And when we think about trends in solar and batteries and how it affects our businesses, we think about from an operational consolidation perspective. So we think about, you know, what are the consolidation of business trends happening to, and to, to reach scale? Or what are the financing trends that we're seeing around solar and battery that can help us reach scale? So you have sort of two sets of trends that we follow. Um, Yes, the declining costs of the types of materials that we use are amazing, but for us, the most important trends are how, how is money being allocated in our space and how are companies coming together in order to achieve scale? So I think two of the biggest trends that we'll see over the next five years in emerging markets as it comes to scaling solar is going to be, can people come together in order to achieve greater scale and can money be more concentrated in order to help these larger companies create scale. And I think if those two things happen, you'll see a very different side of solar in emerging markets. Yeah, solar technologies are definitely um, on my radar. I mean, you, you see companies like Tesla come out with solutions, yeah. not only for the self-driving car that is electrified, but also you see the same company or, or at least adjacent companies that are doing um, creating solar roofs and those roofs are aiming yeah. to create a more sustainable world. So let's, let's sort of project into the future. Like, let's play the Wayne Gretzky game. You know, we have unlimited energy, right? Unlimited yeah. solar energy. It's able to sort of fulfill all of our energy needs, right? We don't need to do coal. We don't need to do wind. We don't need to do anything yeah. because solar is now to the point where um, the energy that is collected through a solar panel is so efficient that we can store as much as we want. We can route the energy anywhere we want. And so in this uh, future state, imagine 30, 50 years from now, we have unlimited energy. So, you know, how can, um, what can we do now that will help us to, to get to that state? Well, what can we do now to help us get to that state? Yeah. So, one is on the policy side, just got to lobby the hell out of these things. <laughs> yeah. um, um, and, and that question actually depends on where you live, right? right? So where are you today? I'm from Vancouver, Canada. So I was born in Toronto. So if you're in North America right now, it's, it's lobby, right? You got to lobby mm -hmm. for more equity, right? So for example, in Sioux County, in uh, where the Sioux tribe is based in the United States, um, they have, so when you sell energy back to the grid, there's a certain rate at which you can sell it back to the grid. And that's a way for people to generate revenues from generating excess power. And that's a great policy and a great incentive to improve the uptake of solar. Now in this county, which is one of the top five poorest counties in America, there is a waiver that the county got in order to to price the feed in tariff way less at like two or three cents versus the 12 or 13 cents, I believe. Now that is keeping people in poverty. So you need to create, you need to create policies that incentivize everyone equally in order to scale these types of technology in those markets. In Sub-Saharan Africa um, and other emerging markets, in order to get to this future state, this Wayne Gretzky model of, of free power, we need to show that these business models are profitable. We need to have incentives that incentivize governments to prioritize, prioritize this over the long term, not just in their election cycle. And we need to have a lot more money taking bigger risks in order to make these happen. Has to be profitable, right? Unit economics need to make sense. Um, and I think that it's on companies like Sun Culture to show that the unit economics makes sense. I think from a policy perspective, for example, in Kenya, they just reinstated taxes on solar. 
Now, what that means for companies like us is that if those taxes are removed, we can reduce the price of our system by 26%, which means our addressable market expands by 150%. So we're only able to serve half the customers that we can serve by now because of this tax. So we need policies that incentivize the uptake of these types of technologies. And then once you have sort of solid union economics and you have solid policies, you just see money coming in and, and scaling it. But I think it happens in stages. And I think the policy and the sort of profitable unit economics in emerging markets needs to happen. I think we're there with unit economics. I think we're close to being there. I know some companies are there, but it's really then how do you get governments to put in policies that incentivize this? And, and whether it's subsidies, whether it's removal of taxes, we need to figure out a way to make these more affordable for more people. Absolutely. I really appreciate you sharing those um, uh, sort of uh, milestones that people must overcome to get to this future state. I'm also curious for your company as well, Sun Culture. You, today, you're primarily focusing on solar technologies. You've mentioned that you ha are leveraging cloud compute and cloud computing infrastructure. So I'm also curious, you know, wh what are your thoughts for where Sun Culture is going as a technology player, right? You, you obviously will get to that state, perhaps where there is infinite energy, but you know, what are your, your roadblocks or what are your milestones ahead? So here's what's unique about our platform, right? So we have a battery technology that's the strongest off-grid energy management system at its price point, so for rural customers. Um, it can power both appliances for the farm, like water pumps and irrigation, and the household, like TVs, lights, and charging at the same time. It's a very unique part of our platform. We have farmers that grow food and make extra money. So that's a really unique part of our platform as well. Um, and when you start listing out these unique parts of our platform, then you start thinking, okay, how do we leverage these unique parts of our platform in order to add more products and services? What's next for us? Outside of natural geographic expansion, what's, what's next from a service offering? And you really start, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of different ways we can go. Um, this, is, this is the first time, and I don't know if I told you this before, stop me if I did, but this is the, this is the first time in our history that we've had so much choice. You know, when you, when you start a company, um, you don't have so much choice. You kind of have to have to choose one thing and go for it. Now we have capital, we have experience, we have a really good team, we have a good brand around the continent. Um, now the choices are just much broader and it's, it's sort of answering the same question we did when we started is what do we do? But instead of saying we have no resources, we have to pick one thing. Now we say, wow, we have more resources, we have to figure out what that one thing is. Um, so there's, there's options for us. It's, we can provide more productive assets for our customers. So whether that's refrigeration or agriculture processing, we can create more services for our customers, like getting them access to market. Um, we can focus on getting additional sources of revenue in order to lower our prices, to make our, our systems more affordable for our customers. So there, there's a lot of, a lot of different directions and we're, we're in the process of trialing a few of them to see what's best, but. To answer that question, we always go back to the customers. What's creating more value for the customer? Because what creates value for the customers creates value for shareholders and everyone's happy. But it all goes back down to the customer, right? We always say we build solutions for farmers with farmers. Um, and keeping that in mind helps us sort of filter through all of these ideas. Absolutely. Samir, also let's chat about what are some of the things that are happening now because of climate change. So like you've mentioned briefly on this already, but if you have, for example, droughts and they're affecting farmers, then, you know, they're unable to, to do their operations. So, you know, what, what would be a worst case scenario? Like imagine we as society do not adjust fast enough to climate change and climate change continues to get worse, right? So like, what can, what can we do? Um, as either the technology players or as society to make sure that we're prepared for when we have, for example, longer droughts or um, when you have more extreme weather or when, when we're just unable to, to deal with sort of unforeseen circumstances. Like in a way, how can we prepare for yeah. the black swan of like 2021, 2022? It's, it's really thinking about how do you live by yourself essentially it's how do you live in a decentralized community 
you know, going back to our roots, living in smaller communities, living with little excess, living off the land. How do you grow your own food? How do you not waste water? Sort of really going back to the way tribes were. Um, forget about materialism, forget about the new clothes and the new shoes, but how do you really figure out how to survive in smaller communities? Um, how do you meet your energy needs, your water needs, your power needs, your other basic infrastructure needs, your connectivity and internet needs? How do you meet these needs and feel fulfilled as a human being and provide for your family and your community if you're just living in a small community? And I think that those thoughts experiments are really interesting. And you see a lot of these experiments happening around the world, right? Um, you see, I mean, even Burning Man is a great example of, of these types of experiments that have been happening for, for, for decades. And it's really taking bits and pieces out of all of these and putting them together and saying, what would it look like tomorrow if you had to go and get that piece of lead and figure out how to, how to live on it? Um, what would you do for your health? Um, how would you build sustainable, um, eco-friendly homes? How do you educate children in a world where they may just be in smaller classrooms? How do you design for that? And I think it's this whole, it's this whole sort of like democratization of decentralization and democratization of wellness, of education, of um, energy, basic services, et cetera. And it's really thinking about how do you how do you pull that out from what we're doing today and run these small experiments so that if in the worst case and we can't get off of the planet, um, how do you how do you survive? I love this. I, I want to uh, start to making a few concluding remarks. I have about five minutes left and I, I would like to offer um, an insight that that I think is quite useful. So I love this idea that you mentioned, Samir, of the self-sustainability, right? If a farmer can be self-sustained, then you know that is the foundation for many farmers being able to handle unexpected events. Um, I and I also I'm thinking now that you know farming has dramatically or dramatically changed, rather dramatically changed over the last 100, 200 years, right? We went from as a society where 70%, for example, of North Americans, you know, 200 years ago used to do farming or, or agriculture. Now it's like less than 2%. And again, this is North yeah. America, right? So like massive shifts in the way that people live and, and what they do for work. Now, um, the, the fact that the, what we do for our work has changed, how we do farming has changed. And I'm also thinking, like, I, I remember reading a book, which you may be familiar with, the book is called Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Uh, he was a philosopher and um, he did a really interesting uh, thought experiment, which is very similar to what you described, Samir. So I decided to surface this book. He wanted to validate the idea of being self-sustaining and to see you know, what would it take for um, the individual to live by himself, to create his own food, to uh, not rely on society, because he just wanted to go through that experience himself. Again, this is uh, um, the book written by Henry, and he I did I believe he did this about maybe 300, 400 um, 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 months ago. So, yeah, I think it's a, a great book for uh, people to consider, and uh, this book is a, a fundamental book in in its ability to help um, to sort of bridge the gap between. What is able? What are you able to achieve in farming, and what is self-sustaining? So it looks like we lost uh, Samir for a second. I, I hope he's he will be back. If not, we will start to conclude this event. So I encourage everyone who is um, listening to us that if you're interested to learn more about the concept of becoming self-sustaining, I highly recommend you check out Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Uh, and I think it's a good moment to wrap things up. I I think there is uh, the opportunity for for us to conclude this live stream. Today, we listened to how to empower farmers using modern technologies. You know, this live stream, we brought on Samir at Sun Culture, who was very kind with us to share his vision for farming and the future. And I also want to thank him for being with us, um, for, for sharing insights and for guiding all of our listeners to how companies and individuals can, can empower themselves to use modern technologies. 
This live stream is meant to educate, inspire, and share best practices for how entrepreneurs, executives, and decision makers can leverage AI technologies and modern technologies to scale their business. If you're interested to uh, see our upcoming live streams, feel free to subscribe. You can either hit on the bell icon on your social network below, or you can simply type produve.com slash subscribe, and this will give you a chance for you to uh, actually uh, receive email notifications from us. I also encourage you to reach out and create a conversation with us if you're interested to use AI technologies or any modern technology to scale your farming practice or your agriculture problems, then I encourage you to reach out. Again, the link is just down below, and that is produvia.com slash start. This will allow you to have a one-on-one -on -one free consultation with us where we will chat with you about how you can solve problems using technology. So this is a great way for you to uh, consider you know, expanding your um, current sort of um, um, possibilities of what is what are you currently doing and sort of moving that to uh, figuring out a way to leverage other technologies to help you solve the same problems. And again, I encourage you, if you're interested, to culture.com, C-U-L-T-R-U-R-E.com, sunculture.com is a great source if you're interested to learn more about Samir and his team. And I also encourage you to check out produve.com if you're interested to learn more about how an AI agency based in Vancouver, Canada can um, brainstorm ideas with you, how we can help you to solve problems using AI technologies. This live stream is part of a series of live streams that we do um, that covers a variety of topics. We do these live streams on multiple social media platforms, including LinkedIn, YouTube, etc. So I encourage you to subscribe so that you're notified of the upcoming events. And I want to thank you for being with us. It's uh, great to have you. Uh, this is Slava. It's on a Wednesday on March 31st. And I encourage you to uh, get in touch with me if you're interested to chat about AI. Otherwise, I will see you next time.